Hello everyone, I'm Only Jax, and today we are going to be talking about an FBI agent named Bob Hamer who was directly responsible for putting eight pedophiles behind bars in 2005. Before I get too far, I should say, if you haven't seen my previous video on Nambla, it's literally the video just before this one, I highly recommend you watch it. If you refuse, here's a recap. Nambla is a group of pedophiles who organize basically just to share their interests in pedophilia to each other. They parade around as if they're some sort of gay rights activist group when they're absolutely not and in reality to me seem to only kind of exist to manipulate themselves into thinking that pedophilia is okay and to rationalize uh, their vile tendencies they've been around since the 1970s they've tried to go mainstream in the gay rights movement a couple of times and each time they get swiftly ousted out by the rest of the gay rights movement. If you watched my last video and it already wasn't super clear, uh, NAMBLA is not a gay rights activist organization. They never have been, despite their lies and manipulation that they try to do to make you think that man-boy love is a legitimate sexual orientation. It is not, and they know that. I literally said it 35 seconds in. However, for the NAMBLA video, I interviewed Bob Hamer uh, because I had a couple of clarifying questions about the insides of NAMBLA, uh, just because there's not a whole lot of eyewitness testimony because the members who are in NAMBLA who are eyewitnesses aren't exactly the same type of people that are going to be super forthcoming with information from someone like me, someone wanting to make a sort of NAMBLA exposed type video, kind of pointing and laughing at these group of degenerates. However, Bob Hamer was an FBI agent in 2002, went undercover infiltrated Nambla and has tons of eyewitness testimony. I'm going to play the interview for you at the end of this video, so stay tuned for that. If you don't want to listen to Bob Hamer's full story, that's fine. You can skip to, I'll have it marked on the play bar here. Uh, you can skip right to it, or if I remember, here's the time to skip to. Without further ado, let me introduce you to Bob Hamer. First off, let me just say that Bob Hamer is a national hero. Him taking down these eight Nambla pedophiles saved countless children's lives, I would imagine, and we live in a world that's now safer because of him. Bob not only infiltrated Nambla during his time as an FBI agent, but he also posed as a drug kingpin, a hitman for hire, took down many organized crime gangs. Like, this guy's a certified badass. But he began his work with NAMBLA when he was actually assigned to a different case involving an international underage sex trafficking ring that was taking place out of a travel agency. Bob had already heard of NAMBLA and he kind of knew what they were about, so it made sense to him that during this travel agency case, he would actually sign up for NAMBLA to kind of add credibility to his character while he was investigating this case. Unfortunately, the travel agency sex traffic ring case ultimately fell through, but by the time it had fell through, Bob had started getting solicitation from NAMBLA saying, hey, join our prisoner pen pal program. Hey, contribute to the NAMBLA Bulletin, which was their magazine at the time. And so Bob was like, these guys are already into the thing I was investigating earlier. I'm already a member. Let me take this up to my higher ups. Let's see if they'll let me investigate this. And when he brought it up, when the door was open for him, he stepped right in. The supervisor said he was good to go. So he started his three year long investigation into NAMBLA. But it didn't happen overnight. As it was explained to Bob, he would have to be a member in good standing for three years before getting invited to any in-person events. This is when they still had in-person events. But that didn't deter him, and he kept on going. He started writing into the Prisoner Pen Pal program, he started writing for the NAMBLA Bulletin, and he was seemingly everything NAMBLA was looking for as a good member. And because of that, after just 18 months, Bob was invited to his first in-person NAMBLA event. It was now his time to shine. The first meeting Bob went to was in New York City, and Bob recounts during his meetings that no explicit sex stuff was actually talked about during the meetings. So nothing about grooming, nothing about how they like to rape children, none of that during the actual official meetings. Instead, the meetings kind of revolved around, you know, NAMBLA's agenda, how the prisoner pen pal program's going, what they've accomplished this year, and stuff like that. Bob even told me that tasks would be assigned to them during the agenda talks, but then nothing followed up. During the breaks, however, is when the real evil reared its head. During one of the breaks, Bob and some of the NAMBLA members took a trip to a New York City Toys R Us that had a Ferris wheel. Bob said that he could literally feel the excitement of these pedophiles as they got closer to the Ferris wheel, because because they knew little boys would be there. And sure enough, as they got there and leaned on the railing to look at the Ferris wheel, they started looking at, gawking, and fantasizing about these young boys. But they weren't just fantasizing about it in their head. They were out loud saying the horrible sexual things they wanted to do to these little children boys. Bob 
said that at one point he wanted to throw every one of these guys off the railing and honestly who can blame him i would probably throw them off the railing too because i don't have that kind of self-control but bob's the kind of guy bob's the kind of guy who can throw his hook in the water and know when he's got a big fish on it and so he doesn't set the hook for small ones like this that meeting ends bob goes home he starts making friends with other nambla members and months after the first meeting he becomes really close with one of the pedophiles his name is jeffrey devore he was an ordained minister and chiropractor and at one point bob had told jeff that bob's computer with all of his child pornography on it had crashed and in the process of crashing he had lost all of his child porn and he was devastated about it. So Jeff invites Bob to lunch one day, and during this lunch, Jeff presents Bob with a flash drive of 125 images of child pornography, many of which involve a boy child being sexually molested raped by a fully grown adult man and seven videos of a grown man having sex with a minor child young boy so finally after all this time bob finally has something that he can charge a member of nambla with but again bob's the kind of guy who knows when there's a bigger fish out there and he'll wait for the bigger catch thankfully before too long the next opportunity would present itself as bob was invited to another nambla event in miami florida after receiving this invitation, Bob and his team got to work figuring out some sort of plan that involved a travel agency that did what's called boy lover trips, where a travel agency would book a boat for you, take you to a country where either the age of consent is lower or it's easier to get away with having sex with children, and they'll book the trip for you, they'll get you there, they'll get you home. So Bob's plan was simple, get as many NAMBLA members on board with this trip as possible. Bob recounts spending some time figuring out how to naturally bring this up in conversation, but unexpectedly to him, he didn't have to. Because at the Miami meeting, very soon after he got there, he was approached by a couple of NAMBLA members who had said they had taken these boy lover trips and that they would like to do it again. And so all Bob had to do was bring up, hey, I know this travel agency, you give them a deposit, you get on a boat, you go to Mexico, we have sex with young boys, bada bada bing bada boom. And just like that, his plan was set in motion. Bob was able to arrange for seven men to take the trip. Now, the way Bob explained it to me was to actually get a conviction, they had to have their security deposit already with the company, which would be the fake travel agency at this, with the FBI run travel agency. So they had to pay their security deposits. They had to explicitly say that they were going to another country to have sex with minors. And then they had to go to the boat dock or at least, you know, go to where this all would take place. Bob arranged for the seven men. He got their security deposits. He got them on audio recording saying specifically the sex acts they were gonna do with these boys. And now all he had to do was just drive them to the boat dock. So Bob was responsible for getting four of the pedophiles to the boat dock. And this was in California. So if you don't live in California, we have these El Nino winds and rains. And El Nino winds and rains, like it can happen any time of year. But during the time that Bob was driving these guys to the boat dock, it was, I think it was January, February, they had these El Nino winds and rains. and so. Bob was really worried that, you know, these got all these guys at the hotel. They're about ready to get to the boat dock, but there's, it's storming, it's raining cats and dogs. And so Bob thinks, man, you know, I'm super worried about one of these guys deciding, you know what? It's too rainy. We don't want to do this. Let's come back another week and do this another time. Like the travel agency, the boat, it's not going anywhere. Thankfully for Bob, pedophiles do what pedophiles do. And they commit to doing sex crimes with children. So not one member brought up that the winds and the rains were gonna be an issue. And so they all got in his car. And so Bob drove them to the boat dock. At the boat dock, FBI agents were already hiding. And so when Bob got out of his car, along with the other pedophiles, they stormed in. Bob was still in character at this point. So he like threw up his cane that he had as part of his character, made like a wimpy scream and then pretended to faint and an FBI agent caught him and took him away. But they arrested the other four members that was there. At another boat dock, three other members arrived and were arrested as well. So in total for the boat trip, Bob got seven pedophiles arrested and locked up. And then also they got Jeff DeVore, the guy who gave Bob child porn earlier so in total eight guys all but one man named sam lindblad just straight up pled guilty to the charges sam was found guilty at his trial and because he had prior convictions due to child sex crimes he got 30 years in prison so that's bob's story we're gonna run the interview now but i really appreciate uh you taking the time to chat with me today i uh so just a little bit of background i've wanted to get into the youtube game for quite a while but never really had uh, a set of subjects that i kind of wanted to explore and kind of shine a spotlight on i've known about nambla for a long time uh you know my dad 
had watched the South Park episode, showed it to me as a kid. Um, and so I've known who these guys are for a bit, but I never really understood kind of like the history of it. When I started doing research into it, when you search Nambla on YouTube, you're the first thing to come up. But I walk away, I'm like, man, what a hero. You know, this guy is having to suffer through three years of uh, undercover man boy love stuff. And I'm just, I can't, I can't imagine how, um can't imagine the kind of stress that must have put you under. Um, but I mean, at the end of the day, what was that? Eight convictions you had? Uh... Yeah, we got, we got eight with that. I, I laughed because I was actually working three cases at the same time. So I was going to ask about that. So it's like, you know, you're undercover hitman. You're, you're an undercover hitman, you know, from noon to four o'clock and then you go home and write your Namblo magazine or how does that yeah. all work? Yeah, no, I, I mean, I, I was, I was working three different cases at the same time. So we infiltrated a Vietnamese gang in San Diego. And then I was involved in a case called Operation Smoking Dragon, which was also a three-year undercover operation, primarily based out in the San Gabriel Valley. It started with counterfeit cigarettes and evolved into a $60 million shoulder fire missile deal with the Chinese. We were going to build a meth lab in North Korea. North Korea was going to give me $40 million a year of counterfeit money. So yeah, I really, I really appreciate um, you being here with us. So um, I'm going to be honest for the whole, uh, you know, infiltration story. There's I, there's a couple different retellings on YouTube um, and, and I don't want to take up too much of your time. So uh, that I'll be able to grab uh, from there. But I had a couple of clarifying questions as my, um, it's really difficult to find eyewitness testimony of uh, what Nambla was like really behind the scenes. And what made me want to get in contact with you um, is that you had said something to the effect of Nambla isn't actually an advocacy group to change the laws. It's more so a place for, well, it was uh, when they were in person, a place for guys to get together and talk about their um, exploitation and methodology. Um, I was wondering, like if there's a little more elaboration to that, we're like, yeah, I think you had said in the true spies one, um, you know, the meetings took place and they talked about the Nambla agenda and then the real conversation happening during the breaks with the, during the meetings with the agenda, was any of that discussed during the breaks or was any of it taken seriously or was it more to just kind of keep up appearances? Like we're an act, we're a, we're an activist group or we're trying to get this done. But in reality, that's not the case. Yeah, no, that, it never took place. And the first national meeting I attended was in, uh, in New York. And during that meeting, they were celebrating their 25th anniversary. So it was more a rehashing of history, just discussing how it began, some of their successes, the problems with the Jeffrey Curley case, which Horrifying to go underground, and therefore, it was more about. It. There was never any discussion about contacting our politicians, writing letters to the editor. Nothing was about the alleged mission of NAMPLA, which is to abolish age of consent laws. There, right. there was there was no political discussion at all. In the first meeting I attended in New York, it was more about celebrating the 25 years of NAMBLA and where they go from there. In the second meeting that I attended in Miami, Florida, uh, again, it was just about where do we go? The, the organization is weak. It needs new leadership. It needs new strength. It needs new direction. But there was never any discussion about how do we contact our legislators how do we get the age of consent laws abolished which is their their first amendment their their position on why they deem themselves a first amendment organization no actual advocate activism as far as uh getting the age of consent laws abolished on nambla's website they have a couple of things that say that they say their mission is to abolish the age of consent laws they also have a couple other like how they're doing this sections so i wanted to ask you um during your time as an undercover agent infiltrating NAMBLA, did you ever witness NAMBLA try to educate the general public on the benevolent nature of man-boy love? No, the only, th the only thing that I saw at the New York meeting, 
we divided up in groups, uh, the leadership, the steering committee, uh, which is the, the governing body of the organization, mm -hmm. had wanted to put out a series of pamphlets with various topics, uh, privacy issues, how to come out, uh, famous NAMBLA members, the different pamphlets that they wanted to put out, but not once did any of those pamphlets ever come out. In fact, uh, I was on the privacy committee. I came back, clipped and pasted some stuff and sent it in and sent it to the members, the other members on the committee. No one ever responded back to me except for Peter Herman, who was sort of the head of the organization. And he just sent back to me and said, hey, I need you to make this shorter. I need it for one page rather than the two or three pages that I sent. Well, I wasn't interested in modifying it for him. But now a year later, when I go to the second meeting in Miami, Florida, not one of those pamphlets was, was uh, completed. So if there were an effort to get the message out to the public, it probably would have been through these pamphlets and nobody acted upon it. No one did it. I was apparently the only one that even submitted anything. So for the most part, the guys that came together, they just wanted to talk about, hey, where do we go to find boys? How do we seduce boys? What, what are your successes? Let's talk about boys. Let's talk about who was your favorite boy actor? I mean, questions like that at, during the breaks. Now, they didn't talk about that during the meetings, but during the breaks, that's what it all came down to. Uh, particularly in the, the Miami conference, it all came down to, hey, where can we go to travel? And where have you traveled in the past? And where has he traveled? And where is it that we can go to, uh, to find boys and maybe stay out of trouble? Or, or how can we be safe on the internet? But those weren't the kind of issues that were being discussed in the actual meetings. It sounds like the way you describe it, um, that anytime these guys were talking about boys, it seems strictly sexual. Um, Nambla on their website and with the literature I've seen, they try to like really double down on it's more of a romantic and mentor apprentice type thing. And that sometimes it doesn't have to be sexual. But hearing you talk about the uh goings on of these guys you know who are at the meetings it doesn't sound like they're talking about that kind of stuff at all it's all it's all sexual um it was, it, it was interesting jackson at the new york meeting i sat next to a guy in fact he was on the privacy committee with me retired school teacher out of new jersey and someone else came up and essentially interrupted our conversation which initially was like hey i'm talking here but this other guy came up and, and interrupted our conversation because he too was from New Jersey and he wanted to talk to Jim who was from New Jersey. So I just sat there and listened. I'm, I'm wearing a recorder, so I'm recording the whole conversation. Mm -hmm. And this younger fella asked Jim that he said, what percentage, what percentage do you think are true boy lovers? And Jim said, I think it's essentially 70% are sexual deviants and 30 percent are true boy lovers in wow. other words the 70 percent were just in it strictly for the sex the true boy lovers were the ones that wanted to develop relationships wanted to develop friendships that would eventually lead to sex you're right it always came down to sex but it it wasn't this for the 30 percent it was they they appreciated sort of having the relationship sure. i mean i guess it's the equivalent of you know you date a lot of girls but some of them it's just i'm going to take her to the movie one night and it just didn't work out so so that's it but then the others you find someone and now you try to develop that relationship and their grooming process was the same as as you and I would do to to uh, try to find that that mate. It's from some crazy stuff for sure. Um, I wanted to ask on a personal note when you talk about uh, you know you driving up to with the members in your car to the boat before the FBI comes to arrest them. How good did that feel? You know what it, that 
it was such a it was such a difficult moment for me because this had been three years now that that I've been in the organization and not on a daily basis. I mean, not, not even close to that, but I've been a member for three years. Uh, in most of my other undercover cases, you always had one or two counts that have already been put together. I mean, you do a small drug deal before you put together the, the multi-kilo deal. So you've got at least one count. You've got some, some conspiracy count. Mm -hmm. There's, there's always something there, but for NAMBLA at, at what, there was a point that they could always back out and probably wouldn't be charged, even though in my mind, they had violated the law because they traveled in interstate commerce. Every one of these people came from outside the state to come to uh, Los Angeles and San Diego. So the, the statute is written. If you travel in interstate or foreign commerce for the purpose of having sex, then that's a violation. But always there's always that chance that you could back out in, in other words if someone hires me as a contract killer to kill someone and then they say look i'll, I'll pay you here's who i want here's what they look like but then they go wait a minute i've changed my mind i back off probably they're not going to get charged i mean at least in the southern district of california in the central district of california in the ninth circuit they're probably not going to charge you so with NAMBLA, it was still, it was like, until we got to the parking lot, until we got out of the car, then, then I knew that, okay, it's all good. I, I, I mean, I will admit once we got into the car, cause we were only driving the length of a football field or something to get to allegedly the dock where the boat was supposed to land. But, uh, as, as you're well aware in Southern California, get these El Ninos and La Ninos, oh, yeah. and it was pouring down rain. I mean, it made no sense to go on a boat in the kind of weather that we were having. And I was so afraid that they were going to back out. Even the morning of, it was, it was pouring. And I offered to them, look, you know, we don't want to take the boat. Let's just get in the car and we'll, we can drive across the border. I'll run a car. Nobody will know that because I just I I didn't want them saying you know what let's forget it let's not do it this week let's let's all go home and we'll come back in two weeks and uh, when the weather clears up but they didn't do it they all got in they all committed I, I really appreciate you taking the time to do this with me and uh, hook me up with research research uh, resources um, I hope you have a great rest of your night uh, and if I have Good any more night. Nambla questions I'll shoot you an email I really appreciate yeah. it Good thing okay let me know when you when you comes out. Will do. Thanks. All right. Thank you, sir. Bye-bye. I hope you liked this follow-up video. Again, I really wanted to put the Bob Hamer interview into the last Nambla video, but it just didn't flow correctly. I'm glad I did the video that I did. I'm glad I'm doing this one now. I think it works out a lot better this way. I wanted, I really wanted to give Bob his own time in the spotlight and not just the little clip I had used in the last video. So if you like this video, please subscribe. Um, I really appreciate everyone for coming out, liking, commenting, subscribing to the last one. If you like this video, subscribe. Uh, leave a like, leave a comment. But for now, don't be a pedophile and I'll see you in the next one.